Hello there, Jeff Snow from First Baptist Church here in Port Hope, welcoming you to another um, short talk, um, replacing our regular Sunday morning services. This is for Sunday, June 21st. You'll be watching this October 23rd, 2023. Hopefully, it'll still be applicable. Um, I'm recording this for having a bit of a heat wave, so I'm here in my office. I have to turn all the fans off, otherwise, you probably wouldn't hear me. I tried to, to use the church microphone and sound system, but I am not very good technically, so I keep ending up back at the office. So I hope this comes across okay. We are hoping to open the church on Sunday, July 5th. Um, churches in Ontario are allowed to be open as of last Sunday, so we decided to give it a few weeks, see how things go, make sure we have all our ducks in a row and we can do all the appropriate physical distancing that's needed. And so our hope is um, Sunday, July the 5th is when we'll be open. If you're watching this, you can jot that down in your calendar and keep a watch on our Facebook page. Facebook page? Yes, Facebook page as opposed to the website. Watch the Facebook page and we'll have information for you there. I've often enjoyed attending services at Anglican churches. Um, there's something really nice about the litur liturgy that they do, um, some powerful words in the readings that they do. Um, and I've often heard messages on topics that I wouldn't normally hear elsewhere. And I think part of that is because they go through the church calendar throughout the year, and the church calendar has certain days that are devoted to certain parts of the story of the church. And probably about 15 years ago, I heard a sermon at the Anglican Church on the subject. That was the first time I think I'd ever heard an entire sermon devoted to that, that subject, and I don't think I've heard it since. And I'm going to share a bit with you, and if I was doing this live in the church, I'd probably spend more time going deeper into it. I don't want to be too, too long on the internet, because I find it hard to watch a long sermon on the internet. I don't know about you guys, so I don't want to put you through that. But let me give you a short overview about the topic of this church, this, this sermon in this Anglican church. And they talked about angels. Angels. I was um, in the Bible study with one of the university students that I work with. We get together and we've been reading through the book of Acts. And we came across a section where angels intervened in the life of the apostles two times in that one chapter. And it really got me thinking about what role the angels play in our lives. First of all, I want to look at two what I think are common misconceptions that even Christians have about the angels. And the first misconception that I think that is widely held is that angels are dead people, people who lived on earth and have died and gone to heaven and have become angels. Now, popular culture and popular movies and stories have been have perpetuated that idea. I mean, one of my three all-time favorite movies, my, I, I call it my Desert Island movie, if I was going to be on a desert island with electricity and a DVD player, uh, what three movies would I want to bring? And, and one of them is It's a Wonderful Life. You see that every Christmas on TV. And in It's a Wonderful Life, one of the main characters is an angel named Clarence, who's trying to earn his wings and he is somebody who once lived, and I think in one part of the movie he says that he is 183 years old or something, last Tuesday. And um, there's another popular television show that I know a lot of people like from the 80s called Highway to Heaven with Michael Landon. And it's a really good show with a lot of good messages and morals, and I don't want to really want to diss the show, but they ha it has one major flaw. The main character in the angel is a dead person who has come back to life as an angel. I know sometimes when loved ones pass away, we, we have this really nice thought that, oh, Grandpa is now an angel watching over me. Well, Grandpa is watching you from heaven. And God does have angels watching over you, but Grandpa hasn't become an angel. And I think that's just such a common misconception that we have. But, but angels are real, and we'll get to that in a minute. Another misconception that maybe isn't quite as common is that angels are intermediaries between us and God, that we can somehow channel our angels so that we can 
get messages from the spiritual realm from this angel. I remember one of my high school students telling me that, and my response to her was, why go through the middleman? Why not just go right to the boss? God has given us the opportunity to talk to him directly. Excuse me, to have a personal relationship directly with God. So, and Jesus said, no man, no person comes to the Father except through him. So why would we stick someone else in the middle? And God is saying, talk to me, come to me directly. You don't need to channel an angel or talk to an angel and use them as a middle, middle person. So those are two common misconceptions that I think even Christians have, and we need to kind of let go of those and understand just what angels really are created for. And the first thing is that they're meant to bring messages from God. We see that at Jesus' birth. We see it at Jesus' death and resurrection at the tomb. Angels, there's a very Greek word in the Greek New Testament, angelos, that we get angel from, means literally messenger. The main purpose of an angel. Talk about Highway to Heaven, being a TV show. A few years after that, another show about angels came on called Touched by an Angel. And uh, it got things a little more correct. The executive producer of the show was a devoted Christian who uh, did her best to follow scripture in all of her story writing. And um, so every, a plot of every show was an angel giving a message, which is the primary purpose of angels, to give a message from God. Another purpose of an angel is, is to be, and this is always pleasant, but it's to execute judgment. To execute judgment. And we think that might be solely in the Old Testament, but it also happened in the New Testament as well. And in the chapter I was reading with my student, Acts chapter 12, we read about um, King Herod, who is speaking to the people, and the people are worshiping him as a god and not a man, Scripture says. And Herod didn't do anything to dissuade them. He was taking God's place as an object of worship. And the scripture says, immediately because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down. And yeah, he was eaten by worms and he died. Ew. But just the idea that angels are used, not the most pleasant purpose that we, from our perspective, but to execute judgment. Angels praise God continually. Revelation 4.2 talks about angels in heaven just repeating over and over through the ages, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And so when we gather together in praise to God in church or wherever we gather together, we're joining the angels in heaven, worshiping God our Father. Which is, I stop to think about that sometimes. It just blows my mind that uh, we're joining in angels of heaven in worship to God. Angels are used to rescue. Um, in this Acts chapter 12 passage that I was looking at this week, um, actually, here, I've got the story I'm going to show it to you on the screen. Get this right. There it is. There it is. So Peter was arrested for, for spreading the gospel. And in Acts 12, verse 7, it says, Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. The angel struck Peter on the side, and God woke him up and said, get up, get up, quick, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. And then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of prison, but he had no idea what, that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the open to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. And when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left them. Then Peter came to himself and said, "Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent His angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches, whoops, and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen." This is an example of God using an angel in a supernatural way to rescue one of the apostles, to rescue one of the believers. Um, angels are meant to protect. Angels are sent to protect. This is one passage. I always keep this passage in my mind. Um, yeah. My screen thing is low. Sorry, here we go. 
I like, I like this passage because the very first time I ever did a solo in church when I was in a choir, these were the words in, this, in my little piece of solo in a song that we sang. And Psalm 91 says, If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in your hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. I think sometimes when we think of angels, we like to think of a guardian angel, someone who's protecting us. And um, scripture and the scholars seem a little bit mixed about does each person have their own guardian angel? I know, again, that's another great, perhaps it's a misconception. There's a couple of scripture verses that might lead one to think that. Um, I would tend to think that we don't have our own personal guardian angel, but that God does send angels to protect us and to watch over us when needed. Um, I've heard the stories I've heard of growing up on the mission field of um, people very angry at missionaries being in their town and wanting to, to drive them out or even kill them, burn their house down. And, and uh, people coming to do this and uh, stopping dead in their tracks and, and all the missionaries were there face to face with these warriors with weapons, you know, wondering what was going to happen. And then the, the warriors just turn away and missionaries find out later that they were saying, well, we couldn't attack you. <laughs> Didn't you see the angel with the flaming sword swinging between the in front of you? Um, it's amazing stories of how God has used angels in different situations to, to be protective, to provide protection. And God uses angels, even if we don't see them or recognize them, to protect us too. And then finally, um, God uses angels as a, to comfort and minister to believers. In First Kings 19, we read the story of Elijah and how he, he, he was desperately running from his, for his life from those who were trying to, to track him down and, and kill him. And, and he was discouraged and depressed and would just wanted to lie down in the desert and die. And an angel came to him and said, Come on, get up, and provided him with some food and did it twice so that he could be strengthened and fed and continued on. Um, angels are able to come and, and be a minister to believers and, be, and to, to comfort them and to watch over them. And then to go back to the protection piece. And, and I think this whole idea of rescue, protection, and comfort is where we would most connect with the idea of angels. And in the, in the context of where we're living right now in the middle of the COVID virus, um, God wants to rescue us, protect us, and watch over us and comfort us. He does that by his Holy Spirit directly, but he also uses ministering angels to do that. I was speaking of the story of protection. Um, and then my friend Paul and I, um, there was a time about 15 years ago when every year we would buy tickets to go see an NHL game in the States, in a city that was within a, within a day's drive of, of where we lived in southern Ontario. And we decided, I think this was the time we went to Pittsburgh. And we were coming back. Paul was driving my car. At the time, I had a big, huge station wagon, very, very heavy. And I said to him, this is, and he drove a little four-cylinder Toyota with an automatic. And I told him, I said, your sister in the drive for a while, and uh, it's a very heavy car. You've got to allow for braking. And so we're whipping along the QEW, listening to Petra, driving pretty fast. And all of a sudden, all of the brake lights in front of us stop. And we're in the passing lane. And uh, just as I'm about to say something, Paul goes, oh, crap, and, and he goes to um, stop the car, but he, he reaches for the stick shift, which, of course, isn't there, in panic, and then he slams on the brakes, and the car starts to swerve because the road was a little wet, and it turns 90 degrees to the right from the passing lane through two lanes of traffic, and I still can, to this day, I can see, so I'm in the passenger seat, I can see uh, these truck headlights through my side window. So we did a complete 180 spin to two lanes of traffic and rested on the soft shoulder of the, of the far side of the QEW. And we stopped, 
and uh, look, and all the cars were still kind of motoring along at, at 80 kilometers an hour at a pretty steady pace, pretty close to each other. And I'm thinking, how did we get through that without causing harm to somebody else, let alone harm to ourselves? And I didn't see anything. Um, but it just felt like there was angels on each corner of that, of that big red station wagon guiding it through that traffic and protecting us. God has a way of, of working through angels to protect and to minister and to rescue. And then the angels aren't, they aren't meant to be worshipped. And I, you know, a lot of those things that uh, we just talked about are things that we recognize God doing by his Holy Spirit. And we think sometimes, well, why? Holy Spirit does all that. Why does God use these angels? But in his wisdom, those are something that he's decided he wants to do to, to minister to us through these beings that he has created that are totally different than humans. Beings that, that minister to us, that praise and worship him, and that, that also give his message to, to people and places where maybe humans aren't able to deliver the message. One last thing as we consider it about angels, Hebrews 13.2 is an interesting scripture verse because it talks about Paul, well, Paul or whoever wrote Hebrews, we weren't sure if it was Paul, um, said to show hospitality to strangers because in doing so, many people have entertained angels without knowing it. So one at consequence of recognizing the existence of angels and the importance of angels should be to make us hospitable to strangers. That as Christians, we would welcome the stranger, that we would do all we can to, to be hospitable to them, to feed them, to, to help them out. Because, well, first we would want to do it because they are God's creation. We want to minister to them because God would want us to. But this verse also gives us an extra reason. We might actually be ministering to an angel without even knowing it. And so those are just some of the things that to think about in terms of some of our misconceptions we might have had, and in terms of who angels really are, and how God wants to work through them, especially in the difficult times in our lives, like Elijah, when he's at his lowest, that God wants to send his angel his power to be able to strengthen us, to help us, and to continue to work in us daily through the Holy Spirit to be able to be there for us in so many different ways. That's about it for today. Um, yeah, join us again next week online, and in two weeks, hopefully, at the church itself. We're going to continue putting stuff online, messages and devotionals and music as well. Um, just so that if you don't live around Port Hope, you can still take advantage of that and hopefully there's a blessing to you. I hope you get a chance to listen to Ruth's stories and to the music as well. So until next time, God bless the popular.